Hello, I'm Dr. John Thompson. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today, I'm going to be going over advanced extraction workflow techniques. Um, we're going to be talking about some exciting stuff. Uh, first, we're going to go through some of the overview of the uh, extraction process. Then we're going to really go deep dive into each uh, part of the process. We're going to show you pictures of the equipment. We're going to show you pictures of the oils. It's going to be really exciting. Thanks for being here. Let's get started. So first what I'm going to do is give you an overview of the entire process, um, starting with raw material. Typically, you get the raw material in. It's either, it's either on sticks uh, and stems. It has it on there, or it comes in bags of bud or flour. Uh, you receive it into your process. It's important that you have all the proper uh, metrics associated with that. Um, then you go to lab testing. Sometimes you'll put it into quarantine. Uh, then you go into grinding. Um, and that's where you're taking large particles and bringing them down to small particles. And then you basically either dry it or remove the carbon dioxide. And during that process, you collect all your terpenes um, for that particular batch. Then you extract it. And what that means is you're taking all the waxes and the cannabinoids and you're bringing it from a plant material into an oil. And once you do that, it's very important that you remove, say, some of the waxes and some of, some of the other stuff that comes out of the plant that uh, may not have such desirable characteristics. So a lot of people remove those and, in a dewaxing or a winterization step. And I'll go into what that means. But essentially, what you get out of that process is a dewaxed oil. And that doesn't mean that it flows properly, uh, it flows, freely flows. It's still a very thick, uh, very viscous oil. Um, and once you have that dewaxed oil, then you can uh, upgrade the potency quite a bit by um, going through a distillation process. Once that distillation process is done, that'll produce distillate right around, you know, 70 to 90% potent. So that distillation process is a really really great process that allows you to uh, take a, an oil that would have less value and bring it up to an oil that has a lot of value. Um, and then you can also basically take all of the cannabinoids out there and make it into crystal isolate. So that, that's, that's another thing that is done. Um, that typically is a white powder. Second option for you would be to not only take it to a white powder, but to basically bring it into a separations unit where you could uh, separate out the oils from uh, themselves. Like you could separate out the THC from the CBD, or you could separate out the THC from the CBN and create large amounts of pure product that still has a lot of the matrix in it. So that's the difference between isolate and uh, broad spectrum. You can go into a formulations process where you take those oils and you bring them to, uh, into products and then package them. So that's the overview, um, and I think it's a really quick rundown, but what I'm going to do now is show you uh, s basically some of the materials that come out of each of the processes, some of the um, equipment that you would use to convert uh, at every stage, and I'm going to be doing that in about 20, 25 minutes, so it's going to be pretty fast-paced, so let's get going. So here's a picture of a, a series a progression of products. So you can see over on the left-hand side, uh, you have uh, buds in a, in a beaker, and then you grind that, those buds up into small particles. The small particles then are decarboxylated. In other words, you're taking a lot of the uh, water out, you're taking CO2 out, and, and you're also taking um, a lot of the pure terpenes that are out. That's a one really great way to preserve the terpenes. And then in the middle there, that's uh, what we call uh, crude oil. That comes from CO2, which is our process. Um, and that, that particular crude oil is um, essentially, it's about 60% potent, 60 to 70% potent, depending on um, how you run your parameters. When you take the waxes out of it, right next to that crude oil, that's you see that's a dewaxed oil. 
and then off to the right-hand side as you uh, go to a distillate, and then finally an isolate. So um, that's a typically the isolate is about 99 plus percent pure. And um, what's wonderful about it is it's great for formulations if you don't want to have, for example, the matrix, the plant matrix in there. Yeah, the raw material that comes in, here's what it looks like. Uh, and you can see all the sticks and stems on there. We get usually in super sacks. Um, you know, if you're doing cannabis, you typically have uh, just the flower only without the sticks and stems. Um, typically, if you're doing hemp, sometimes the hemp is chopped like in the field with a combine. And then they're delivered in these big white super sacks that you see. Bottom line there is, you know, you're going to get uh, materials in from a, a variety of different ways. Um, and the super sacks are a really great way to really move the material around. Once you get the material into your facility, you're going to have to weigh it in. You're going to have to barcode it. And we use a process and a, and a software called IGW Lab to accomplish that. This is an example of a station. And basically what it is is it's a, it's a software-hardware combination. The hardware is consisting of a scale, and the scale changes in size depending on which process you're using. So you wouldn't weigh in a super sack with a, a small scale that you see there. Um, but uh, basically it comes with the scale, uh, it comes with a barcode reader, a barcode printer, and uh, the software station. And the stations are set up throughout the entire process. You can see on the chart, you'll see that there's an IGW in between each process. And basically what it's doing is it's weighing in the uh, raw material, it's weighing out the product, it's weighing out the, uh, you know, any kind of waste, it's also weighing out any kind of byproduct, for example, the terpenes. It's barcoding everything, and then it's also recording all of the, what equipment is being used, who is doing it, um, are they trained, along with training records, calibration records, maintenance records, uh, cleaning records, uh, anything that you can think of that would be required by Health Canada or by the uh, FDA GMP. It really is a system there that uh, allows you to um, take your process and mistake proof it, um, take samples, bring, send them to the lab and then have all of that information from the very beginning attached to the batch record. Uh, and this is really what, um, you know, regulators are looking uh, to do. So, um, that's with the IGW lab. Here's a, here's a picture of that. Um, and then of course you go into the lab testing. Now lab testing, uh, an essential piece of operations um, and basically you have to sample uh, basically at any yield process so if you have a yield from say going from biomass to extraction you should be measuring before and after and monitoring from a business perspective um, you know how that process is doing so um, IGW lab along with lab testing which is kind of built into it it's got what they call a laboratory information system built right into the system um, these two things in combination really keep it all organized. Um, for new operators, sometimes uh, organizing all the paperwork uh, is a huge challenge, and um, it keeps regulators busy. Um, even something as simple as, you know, maintaining records on cleaning your equipment. Um, a lot of those are paper records. What we're trying to do is get away from the paper records, go to an electronic record uh, that can be printed out and signed and stored um, for data integrity purposes. So this is uh, an example. We've set up laboratories all over the country. Um, in fact, we've set up uh, facilities, uh, you know, converting hemp and, uh, and uh, you know, cannabis over to oils. We, hundreds of people we've put into the business, including many, many Canadian LPs and, uh, and operators in Europe as well and in the U.S. Um, so this is an example of a, a system that would be used to test pesticides. Uh, this setup right here would range anywhere from $250,000 to $500,000. Um, you can see that in this picture right here, we're measuring, we're measuring uh, some solvents, for example. And in the background there is uh, what's called a QTOF. And that piece of equipment is vital because it is uh, the key piece of equipment that allows an operation to understand what the unknowns are in their sample. A lot of times uh, people send their samples out, they get pass or fail data, but they don't get unknown data. 
And uh, I tell you, the unknown data is extremely important for maintaining the integrity of your products. Um, if you don't have it, you're really flying blind. And because the third party um, testing doesn't really give you those unknowns. Here's this, just a workhorse piece of equipment. It's called an HPLC. And what this does is it measures your potency, purity, and identity. So we set up these labs for uh, many, many customers um, with any number of, you know, analytical techniques. They typically include um, HPLC for potency, purity, identity, uh, metals, uh, metals testing, which would be uh, ICP-MS, we also um, set up uh, pesticides measurements, so that's kind of fun, um, just to make sure that you don't have any chemical contaminants in there. And then also we set up solvent testing uh, to make sure that there's no solvents in there. Um, we also set up uh, microbiological laboratories. So those things are um, very part and parcel to a laboratory operation. Uh, moving on to the shuck and buck, um, this is a piece of equipment that if you if you have materials that are coming in with their sticks and stems still on and you need to remove those buds or if you have a grow right next to it and you're not receiving um, the flower in bags, use a shuck and buck piece of material uh, equipment to get that done. It's an automated, it's high throughput. I'm not going to go into this. Just suffice it to say that, you know, it will do large acreage actually in a, in a very small amount of time. So zooming back out here, you can see we've kind of uh, advanced all the way to lab testing. And now I'm going to go to grinding and talk a little bit about how you grind. Now, if you're doing like a ton a day or two tons a day, um, what you use is, is very, very small. You don't need to have a huge system like this. You would use uh, something along the lines of this, this grinder here in combination with this grinder here and this uh, vacuum still here, and those would be all that you need. Now, you don't need to have all of these hoppers and everything because you're really not um, you're really not uh, trying to warehouse tons of materials in between. Um, and you can do that with bins. However, if you want a more automated process or you're doing, uh, you know, three to five tons per day, uh, this is the process that we recommend. Um, and it's really an automated process. Those super sacks are uh, admitted to this uh, grinder system with this uh, forklift, um, and then they're conveyed into a hopper. This hopper can hold up to five tons of ground material per day. I mean, so this is a daily hopper. There's not any storage really that takes place in it other than it just helps uh, warehouse the material in between processes that don't have the same cycle time. Um, and then as you advance through the process, you have a way hopper, and that way hopper really weighs in to this vacuum still here. The vacuum still is where you're taking off all the water, you're taking off all the excess CO2, and you're also taking and grabbing all the terpenes in this process. So this is a very high value process here. And then as you move out of that mixer there, you're moving into another uh, hopper with load cells. So you can see we're measuring before and after the weights, um, and you can take samples too and measure cannabinoids. Um, typically, you will have you will have like ninety nine percent, ninety eight, ninety nine percent recovery of the of the um, cannabinoids. Um, you really shouldn't be losing cannabinoids in here. Um, and then you have a cone mill that's going to take the grind size down to uh, you know a small, say two hundred microns, and then it bags up. And this bagger then goes directly into the uh, extractor. So that's kind of an overview. You can see this is kind of what a, what a, um, a hammer mill material might look like. <clears throat> and you can see now that we're going into the vacuum oven side of it that's uh, in the center of that uh, workflow scheme that I just showed you. Um, yeah, th there is a way to do it with small ovens if you're doing like one ton a day. In fact, it's pretty surprising we use these little ovens like this and um, it's batch process. Um, but it is low cost and also it, uh, it has a pretty high throughput. Um, this is an example of some of the beautiful, absolutely gorgeous um, <clears throat> flavors and aromas. These are terpenes. And you can see they're labeled Cherry River, uh, River Haze, Super Haze, Max Haze. These are, they're strain specific. Um, so you, they, they smell different. They taste different. They have different flavors. You can mix and match different uh, flavors, obviously, um, you know, in your final formulation. Definitely, um, this is the advanced level, actually, of formulations. If you can pull out your, you know, 
those compounds that are um, what they call labile or they're not so stable, okay, and you pull them out before you process, you warehouse them and, and clean them up and then add them back into the processes in the same exact batch, um, that's, in my view, considered advanced because you're really maintaining a lot of the properties without degrading it. So that's kind of a unique to our process. I'm just going to skip through here now. This is an example of what a layout might look like for a, a five ton per day facility. Um, you can see there's storage up on top and then there are these boxes. We use um, 800 square foot, um, you know, panel boxes. You probably have seen some of them used uh, by, you know, uh, by, by growers, for example. We use the same ones. If you need to have, um, you know, fireproof ones, there are, we also sell fireproof ones. Um, not, just suffice it to say that uh, this is kind of an, uh, just a general overview of my, what this might look like. This is approximately 20,000 square feet. Um, we would recommend that you keep all of your dust and dust processes, uh, you know, separated from your oil processes. And um, the way you can do that in, in an open warehouse is uh, through... Um, the use of curtains and HVAC to provide pressures in between each of the different rooms, quote unquote, if you will. Um, the other way to do that is just to warehouse them in, in these uh, boxes and then uh, have separate HVAC on every one of them. So it's, there's, we have had hundreds of installations and hundreds of different ways of doing it. So it's, it's, all, it's all good. Um, there's always some sort of, you know, compromise that takes place. Here's an example of what that might look like you know, looking down a hall. Very typical. Um, this particular facility you see here is a five ton per day um, facility. And uh, also, just so you guys know, we, we operate a five ton per day facility in uh, Wisconsin. And what's wonderful about it is that we can take all of our, our um, process, our R&D, we can take our... Um, a new equipment, we can put it in there, test it out, see if it works, you know, modify it all before we send it out. Um, so <clears throat> our workflow is, is, um, has gone under a tremendous amount of evolution. And also uh, all of our SOPs, they've been honed in. We are a GMP certified facility. We're also certified organic, um, which is a big deal when you're talking about uh, clinical grade oils. Uh, which we produce. Also, our facility is a CO2 uh, extraction facility. And uh, just give you a couple points as to why we think CO2 is a, is a good way to go rather than, than ethanol or any other um, method. Lots of different ways to extract. We, when I started out, I just wanted to have a very, a very clean way of extraction. CO2 really gives you that. Um, because all the other techniques will have residuals in them, chemical byproduct residuals that can't be removed from the oil. And as an analytical chemist, I can tell you, I see everything. You know, we see all of the residuals that are in oil. And ethanol normally doesn't carry residuals, um, but if you use uh, you know, denatured ethanol, which many, many, many companies do, um, you're really uh, hard-pressed to get all of that all of those solvents out of there. Uh, denatured ethanol is when chemical companies add um, the chemicals to the ethanol um, to make it so that you can use it as a extraction solvent. Uh, and um, yeah, so they'll add like heptane or hexane or something like that to it. So um, that ends up not being able to be fully removed from the oil. And I consider that to be a contaminant, even if it passes the test. Um, so I'm not going to belabor that anymore, but just suffice it to say where we are ex CO2 extractors. Um, this is our equipment here. Um, this is called a 180. Three of these can do one ton per day. So it, it's a pretty compact. Um, you can fit three of them into 800 square feet. Um, approximately 500, 600 amps, something like that, at three phase, a 208 volt. Um, yeah, this is uh, some of our CO2 equipment. The CO2 equipment is used to really push, uh, you know, condition the CO2 to to really um, feed these lines. And this is this would be an example of a line. Um, you know, typically one person can run about one ton per day. Um, and, uh, you know, you'd have, you have preparation people in there and things like that. So, um, that's typically how it goes. Here's another example of another line. 
Um, and of course you get barrels and barrels and barrels of, of crude oil out and it's, it's all looking good. Smells wonderful. Um, you know, and you have gallons and gallons of terpenes coming out of your vacuum oven process. So really what you want to do now at this point is to de-wax it. And typically we'll use this, these, uh, large scale, uh, Buckner funnels. They're called drain droids. And, uh, essentially they, uh, they allow you to remove the waxes from the crude oil. And you do that with a process called winterization. Um, and winterization is just simply, um, you add like food grade ethanol. So you don't have those denaturants in there. You're using a small amount of ethanol. You are solubilizing it. You're putting it in the freezer and a lot of those waxes, then they, they precipitate out and then you just decant them and filter them. So that that's all we're doing to make a de-waxed oil. If you need to scale up, um, we also have options for you guys to scale up, uh, up to five tons per day. In this case, it would, it would, um, uh, not be five tons of oil per day, but it would be, um, it would take care of the oil f that came from five tons of biomass. I'm not going to belabor that, um, but just suffice it to say that once you do have that ethanol in there, obviously you need to, uh, you know, take that, that out. So we have a piece of equipment um, called the Fractron. It's um, a GMP piece of equipment. It's, if you notice uh, on our equipment, just a couple quick notes here. You can see that we have, um, basically, we've taken care of all the GMP details. Uh, we have uh, barcode readers right on the equipment. We have uh, scanners right on the equipment. This is a methods run piece of equipment. So typically, I as an operator would scan myself in. I'd, I would pu have a push button method. I'd push the button. It would run the method. It's really convenient. Um, and uh, also traceable, so all the data integrity issues uh, or all of the items that the quality people need to have to put the batch record together are, are taken automatically by the equipment itself. So um, you can see we're now we're at a de-waxed crude oil with no ethanol in it. Now it's time to, to basically distill that, uh, that uh, oil. And the way you do that is you use a clear still, um, which is a piece of equipment. Again, um, we have, uh, there's a high throughput, small footprint piece of equipment, low power associated with this equipment. Uh, all the GMP features, uh, basically built right into the equipment. This is a two stage, um, and that can be hooked up directly to the Fractron, which we saw earlier, uh, just a couple seconds ago. And the great thing about that is it, it just, uh, minimizes any kind of exposure, uh, that you might have uh, for, uh, you know, the oils to the, you know, to the atmosphere. Um, and you can see this is what you get out of that. You know, you can get up to 90% potency easy with these, mm, these pieces of equipment. Um, and you can scale them up pretty easily. They're scalable. That's one thing about, our, you know, our processes all the way through uh, from beginning uh, to the very end uh, here is that they're all scalable. You can scale them up from 500 pounds a day all the way up to five tons per day. Um, and we help you uh, basically get that done. Look at that beautiful oil. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. There's also what's called an isolate process uh, that you take that oil and you can uh, uh, take that distillate, bring it to a white powder. Um, what you want to do then is you, those are laboratory pieces of equipment. Here's what that looks like coming out of that. Um, so we have processes and procedures. There's not a lot of equipment associated with that, just more or less laboratory. Um, and uh, you can make uh, buckets and buckets of uh, what they call, um, you know, isolate. And then we have what's called the Pier 99. Um, that system is essentially a separation system, um, and uh, that's a chromatography system. It's actually my area of expertise uh, specifically, um, and, and what that will allow you to do is keep the, um, all the matrix in there, uh, keep all of the plant material in there, but also separate out all the THC from the CBD. So it's a, it's a great system for maintaining the integrity of the plant, but not have any THC in there. Um, it's also really great for purposes of formulation. So just as just an example, and here's some systems that we have. Once you have these products, you have the distillate, you have isolate, you have the broad spectrum, then you have the, the crude oils. 
you're you're there and now you're using them to really formulate all your all your different products so whether those be edibles you know uh, brownies or gummy bears or uh, gummy materials um, you know cosmetics uh, vape cartridges you know things like that that's really where um, the magic takes place you're using those raw ingredients as a means to to create products so that's what's called formulation and of course we help our customers with uh, formulating uh, products all the time um, and we have a uh, formulations uh, research center here in uh, in Wisconsin and uh, you know we uh, are always at the cutting edge and you know a lot of the what we do is we use those terpenes really to uh, really to differentiate products from one to, from another um, everybody else it seems like they're just you know they're taking all the products and they're uh, they're not really getting out those those terpenes and so that's a big deal for for brand um, you know differentiation and also just for the integrity of the plant itself then you're going to get into packaging I'm not going to go really deep into formulations and packaging because um, we set up laboratories we we set up uh, with IGW lab we'll set up all the batch records we'll set up all the packaging equipment like for example, if you want to have a tincture line with uh, two thousand uh, tinctures per hour, or a gummy line with uh, you know two thousand gummies per hour, just uh, let us know and we can help you set that up. We have a lot of those facilities and a lot of that equipment here, and so we're constantly doing R and D. We're getting our formulas honed. Um, we see what else are water soluble, like for uh, beverages. We also have that, and we know a lot about how to how to micronize or how to nanoize, um, you know, some of that to get it into a beverage. So, um, just like us, uh, if you guys got some moments, uh, you know, scan this. Uh, it'll take you to a screen. Um, you know, like us on Facebook. Uh, follow us on LinkedIn. Um, follow us on Instagram. Uh, we have lots of material coming out, uh, you know, pretty much daily. And uh, we'd love to have you. Um, um, we'd love to have you in our, our uh, fan base. So that concludes our advanced bioprocessing workflow presentation for you guys. I hope it was informative for you. Um, happy to answer any questions. Please email us. Um, and also subscribe on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. All right. Sounds good. I think we're going to take some of your questions. Uh, Randy's going to join us. Okay, and uh, That was awesome, by the way. Yeah. Loved it. Sorry Thank you. Getting set up. Hey, guys. Was that not awesome? The questions have been pouring in. Uh, I I love that whole newfangled thing you did. <laughs> well, you know, somebody's got to do it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and the background was just way cool. All right. I love that. I was mesmerized, man. I, I don't know if you guys were, but I was. <laughs> and, um, and I do this every day. So... Well done. I, it's a Thanks. little disconcerting that we're on opposite sides. Yeah, this I don't know. This is, it was, it's like all that uh, feng shui, or it's, yeah. just, it's, out, it's of, like, out of order. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> I got to do something different. All right. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, okay, so we have had a whole bunch of questions, and one of them is deep, deep, deep. Are we ready Super for deep. A deep? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. It's going to okay. be fun. Okay, so. After supercritical CO2 extraction and winterization with uh, ethanol OH, we allow waxes about 24 hours to precipitate in a minus 50 C freezer and All filter. Right. All right. Is dry ice the most optimal filtration tool alongside a drain droid to stop the temperature from raising and also stopping water from condensing on the product, facilitating wax dissolution? If a cold space is not available to filter in, sorry, this is a long question. This is good. This is a good question. It is a good question. Or, I, I'm following the whole thing. No or, problem. Or are there better, more cost-effective ways to do this? Well, I, okay. So Go. we're talking about filtration yes. and filtration efficiency. And so what what the question is is that when you uh, when you have your super cold, uh, you know, wax plus ethanol. 
uh, and you put it into the drain droid, you don't want it to warm up so it will redissolve uh, the waxes. So um, what he was wondering is if you couldn't add in uh, dry ice in there to keep everything nice and cold. Okay, okay so uh, along with the drain droid. So there's a couple different things. Um, first of all, it's more or less the residence time. How long is it going to take to uh, warm up to, let's say, minus 20, minus 10 degrees, right? How long is that going to take? Um, it's going to take quite a while. Um, so I, what I would say is uh, you have a filter. Uh, I would say pour it through the filter, you know, get a little amount of uh, wax on the filter until it's uh, completely, you know, kind of clogged up. And then I'd change out the filter. Uh, uh, the filters are inexpensive and um, I, I would just continuously change out the filters. That is the surefire way to just keep everything nice and cold. Yeah. When, when, you, when you start filtering, uh, the whole drain droid basically gets really super cold. Uh, you'll get, if, if you have um, like water or, you know, moisture in the room, it'll start to condense onto the drain droid and you can see it's get really, really cold. The other, the other thing that uh, you might want to consider is that we also have a jacket for the drain droid. It's a jacketed droid. Um, it's also one of our products. Uh, so if you want to be able to hook it up to a chiller and just let it sit there for a while, you know, fill it all the way up, let it sit there for a while. I, you could do that as well, but I actually, I don't recommend that. Um, the, the beauty of the drain droid is that you have a lot of surface area and just, uh, you know, once that filtration media gets plugged, change it, um, and, uh, do it quickly, uh, so that it doesn't, uh, sit in there a long time, warm up and then redissolve. So I, I'd say that that's the, that's the short answer to the question. Uh, okay. and then there is a long answer, Randy. Okay. That, that, <laughs> that, that's, that's good. That's only a short answer. So. But the follow-up was, yeah. does chilling at minus 50 C have any adverse effects on products versus winterizing at closer to minus 20? I don't think so. No, there's no adverse effects with chilling. Uh, so an adverse effect in my view, Randy, would be something along the lines of, okay, I am I am now degrading the product and usually you have to have heat to do that. So um, I'd say that, uh, you know, it's not degrading it. Um, one thing that is uh, known, however, is that ethanol, you know, will, for example, uh, you know, react with, uh, say, the other alcohols that are in there. It'll also react with CBD. So if it sits there for a long time, uh, it, it, you'll have a re side reaction take place that's more or less undesirable. Okay, yeah. good. Thank you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still questions are still coming in. Thank you very much for those. Um, another question from Wade is, is it advisable to reintroduce terpenes uh, to a formulated oil besides uh, for sensory purposes, uh, taste and smell like we talked about last week? Right. Um, does the entourage effect still hold up when the product is ingested rather than inhaled? Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, you, you have, uh, it, you know, the terpenes will go into your gut and get absorbed in your gut. So absolutely, I think you have, you still have an entourage effect. Um, it's probably less effective though, because, you know, your gut is made to more or less digest things and it's going to come in there. There's going to be bile acids in there. They're all going to, they're going to start emulsifying it. Okay. So that's one of the reasons why when you get it into your, um, into your stomach, it, uh, you know, the bioavailability, you know, goes down. That's why uh, inhalation is such an effective way because it goes, you know, through your lungs and right into your, right into your spinal cord, up into your brain. So, so it's, it's a lot, it's a lot more effective means of delivery. I know this is kind of an add on thing, but I've heard that, you know, you can ingest it, but that's why with a tincture, you want to hold it under your tongue for right. up to two minutes because that, right. That is a much more bioavailability. Sublingual, yeah. Sublingual under your tongue. Right. And then also, if you um, inhale it through your nose, there's like a mister or something. I've yeah. heard people do that for the, you get the benefit of that. Right. Even at a higher level. Right. Yeah, I think it's uh, sublingual is also a really great way. And, that, you know, they have um, they've done these studies on uptake uh, and things like that. So, I, I mean, there are studies that you have uh, inhalation, uh, sublingual and then through the gut. It's it's me it's metabolized differently uh, when it goes through the gut. It, it The cannabinoids make it through the liver 
and then they're metabolized through uh, through the liver into your brain. Uh, yeah. So that's that's totally different. That they co- totally bypasses that extra metabolistic step. And then there's you know your body uh, converts. Uh, we'll we'll start to convert it. It has receptors, um, and depending on what cannabinoid you're uh, looking at, um, you know, interacting with. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. I am looking at some other questions here. Um, from, sorry, I'm looking over here. Uh, the, there's really small writing on our screen. And it's, uh, I, <laughs> We're totally, uh, uh, totally getting this figured out and, here. And these are trifocals, okay? okay? So that's how old I am. So I can <laughs> see far, see middle, and then see to read. So it, it's, it's good. Thank you, James. James to the savior. He, he increased the size of the writing. <laughs> okay. Um, how many different terms that people are using in the cannabis industry? Kingsley, thank you for your question. Um, That's a good question. Yeah. There's, yeah. What does full spectrum or THC or yeah. full spectrum of THC or CBD product mean? Right. It's full spectrum. Right, right. Okay. So let's unpack this. You yeah. basically have uh, a variety of cannabinoids, right? And then you also have a variety of terpenes Um, and um, you really can't control, for example, uh, you know, what, what that, what those varieties are, uh, you know, what the distribution of those are in the, um, in the system or in the spectrum. So full spectrum uh, really refers to uh, the wide range of terpenes that are in the system. So and it doesn't necessarily refer to a wide range of cannabinoids. Uh, the reason for that is because you really can't, you know, that's really dictated by the plant. Sure. Okay. So the same thing. Uh, so you can't say like, for example, I want a full spectrum uh, oil mm-hmm. with, uh, you know, 0.1% CBN, 0.3% CBC, uh, you know, 50% CBD. Okay. okay. That's a designer that's a designer custom extract. Formulation. That's a custom formulation. It's possible to do all, everything, all of that, but uh, that's not considered full spectrum. Full spectrum is I get the plant in, I extract the plant, I get the, um, the full terpene spectrum in there, the full terpene spectrum plus the cannabinoid that I extract out of the plant. That's the full spectrum oil. Okay. Now, uh, you know, in the CBD world, there's also a requirement for less than 0.3% THC. So uh, in that case, a full spectrum CBD oil uh, would, would have to have less than 0.3% THC, Correct. but it would have the full, uh, uh, you know, terpene spectrum. Okay. This is a little bit different than broad spectrum now. Okay, broad so. spectrum is, is where uh, you, you have um, just CBD in there and no THC, but you also have uh, the full spectrum of terpenes and you have the full spectrum of phytonutrients and things like that. So, um, it doesn't refer to a broad spectrum of cannabinoids. And the reason for that is it's pretty simple. It's the same, the same, uh, you know, basic thought, the spectrum of cannabinoids that you're getting out, uh, really is dependent on the plant. A lot of times there's minor cannabinoids in there, but you never can tell. I mean, some of the strains don't have any of the minor cannabinoids. So I can have a broad spectrum, uh, with, uh, of CBD with no THC in it or non-detectable amount of THC in it and, uh, have my terpene spectrum in there. So, Okay. So yeah, that's the difference between a full spectrum and broad spectrum. And because we were doing cannabis, Canvas 101. And yeah. You, you did that very you know, CBD 101. Everything great. I mean, right. I, I love that presentation. I, oh, thanks. I want that. Yeah. We'll I mean, get it. Because I, I, I've got a lot of people who really want it. Um, and I do have an additional uh, couple of questions from Hussein. And I talked to Hussein yesterday. It was very nice. All right. Um, but the question is if he started to extract CBD in hemp, 2% mm-hmm. concentration, how much can he expect after CO2 extraction? I see. Well, there's, I think that there's a general rule of thumb. Uh, and that is if you have a 10% material in, you're going to get 10% of the of material out. Okay. Um, that's not include, there's, there's a weight recovery and then there's a cannabinoid recovery. 
So um, in terms of that, if you have 2% uh, CBD, you should get 2% weight per weight CBD coming out. If you have 5% uh, CBD, uh, you should get about 5% uh, CBD coming out weight per weight. So um, you may have more than uh, more than that, though, in the total amount recovered because you're recovering more than CBD. You're covering waxes, recovering terpenes, you're recovering other other stuff like that. So, Excellent. but a real good rule of thumb in terms of yield calculations is just to neglect uh, the fats and waxes. So you're always going to be kind of overproducing, you know, if you're doing some estimates. Sure. Okay? okay. And then um, you're kind of always overproducing and kind of hedging your bets on yield and all of that. And just so you know, just so you know, we have a whole slew of calculators coming out. I've been working with the team this week and last week, and we have them and they will be available on our website. They're not available yet. So don't go there. But we're looking at those type of yield calculators from biomass into winterized crude, winterized to distillate, distillate to isolate, different things. And then uh, we have some advanced calculators that we'll have available as well. So if those are of interest to you, you know, give us a shout out on in the chat. As yeah. well, and we'll make sure that you know you you get them ahead of time, uh, and as soon as they're available, we'll get them to you. So make sure that's going to be very. It's going to be great, yeah, because, because people are going to be able to model for themselves. You know, and... I'm not smart enough to do what he did, yeah. it is, but so I use the calculators, <laughs> and it's a lot simpler. That's why we break them out into the multiple calculators. Some of our advanced ones ha uh, that we are building have the entire boom, 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 boom all the way from biomass to isolate if you want to see each step. Right. But there's there's still some, you know, differences as you're getting that yield, you know, what is, you know, how much CBD or whatever is in that biomass or in the crude or or, right. or from the COA. Right. So those are things to take a look at. And, you know, part of this whole thing, I'm, I'm reaching for these other questions. Um, Another question. Uh, oh, wait again. After collecting e extract from a supercritical extraction, if the crude product doesn't have ethanol added immediately, what is the general degree of deterioration from oxida oxidative processes? Ooh. Wow. Wow. Say that so, five times real fast. Okay. So uh, if you take a, a, a beautiful CO2 extract, right, um, and it comes out and it's just this golden, golden oil, you can cap it cap it okay and it'll stay nice and yellow okay yeah. if you if you let it go and you just let the oxygen come in you'll see you'll actually can observe over a period of an hour it'll turn like to a an amber color oh so it's actually reacting in the in the uh you know in the air it's oh. pretty cool so then you you know maybe about an hour I, and that's that's just some of the terpenes you know reacting with the air but you don't have you to can preserve anything. it all you do is put the lid on yeah, yeah, you can preserve it uh, if you'd like to. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't really hurt it because you're you're taking a lot of those waxes out anyway, and the the terpenes. You know, you're going to be doing other processing down the line. Okay. So, yeah. Anyway, so um, we've yeah. Okay. No good. Problem. Good. 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 All right. Um, and you're welcome, Hussein, for the answers. Um, and Eddie, thank you. I appreciate. Uh, he said it's very informative, and I. I, every time I spend time with Dr. John, I learn more and more, and I've been doing this for a while, but uh, it's it's cool. So thank you, Eddie, for the shout out. Um, he also asks, um, if we have an IES CO2 system, can you set up everything else to go with it? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Yeah, no Good. problem. Or can you elaborate? Well, yeah, sure. We we can, uh, well, we can set it up. We can get you, uh, you know, depending on the size of the equipment that you want, we can, first of all, we can get you all of your, all of your quality systems up and running. We can get all of your, we can get your, your, your clear still or your um, distillate systems, your isolate systems. We can get uh, ethanol removal systems together for you. We can train you on that. We can commission everything. Uh, yeah, not a problem at all. You want to talk about, uh, you know, advanced uh, grinding with us, no problem at all. Um, we'll, we'll get you up and running and we actually get you to the point where you can uh, pass a GMP audit. So uh, that's something that uh, we really uh, love to do. That's what we do. So the other thing would be on the front end, if you need your facility designed, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, just like people coming out of the woodwork in their kind of like, oh yeah, we'll design your facility because we designed other facilities. 
uh, we've been doing this since 2014 and it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of things uh, that you want to think about when it comes to uh, your workflow. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, is important that you take, uh, you know, into account is, is uh, basically inventory. Um, that's one thing they really got to worry about. Um, you don't want to have a bunch of inventory stacking up in between each of your different processes. All that is, is money sitting there and you're losing it. So, um, plus you have to pay, uh, tax, it's taxes on the end of it at the end of the year. So you better make sure that inventory is gone or as much as possible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's something, uh, you know, that advanced business, uh, it's called, uh, so like lean manufacturing sure. and, uh, value stream mapping. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I have something, I have something to say. I got, I got a credential. You do. Yeah, I do. I have, uh, let me see here. I was a certified green belt. <laughs> green belt okay. yeah green belt uh value stream mapper for the old company i used to work with i i, I still i'm still i am still a believer in the value stream mapping and the lean stuff Absolutely. i mean a lot of people are you know, like oh well that's just oh yeah we're lean but the, you know you know lean when you see it because there's no inventory around <laughs> okay right. and usually you know you, you go into a manufacturing facility you, say, oh, you just look at you know where look at all the inventory around you're like sure. okay and then they say, oh, yeah, we're, we're lean manufacturing. Oh, they're not. They're, they think they are, but they're not. So, well, And that's, that's slightly different than the, the old just-in-time manufacturing. Yeah. Okay, but, but just-in-time is part of that. Yeah. Okay, so that's what you, you know how much you need for a certain period of time, and then mm -hmm. you just you wear it through. But you want more inventory turns. You right. want to get that, keep it lean. Right. I love the idea of keeping it lean. Yeah. Um, and, and that's one of the promises that we make to you um, – all the time and that is we want to make sure that we're helping you solve your problems we love it when you know we're hearing about your problems where are you having difficulties where are you dissatisfied and what can we do to come and help you now a lot of that has to do with the extraction process and all yeah. of the whole flow that you talked about earlier yeah which is phenomenal but we we also come alongside people and help them with you know avatar client targeting we go through the whole business process we look at you know business plans financials many of you are looking for funding we don't do that just so you know but we've looked at a few business plans mm -hmm. as they're further along um there because we want you to be making profitable revenue right and anything we can do to come alongside you to help make that happen including the whole idea of lean marketing, lean inventory, lean uh, manufacturing processes. Mm -hmm. And last week, if you saw the, and if not go to our other Q and A session, which is on replay as well. Um, uh, I think, are they up on our YouTube channel? Um, yeah. yeah. James is saying, I yes. think so. Yeah. So go to our YouTube channel, like us, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um, but the, the key is that we, in, in that, session we were going through how to help you become more profitable okay and that's what we want to do all all along the way uh through your processing um going to co2 for example the reason that we're uh, co2 believers is because even though the upfront cost might be a little more the operating cost especially right now um, is substantially less um, from an operations yeah. perspective. And that's one of the reasons that we do it. That goes yeah. back to Dr. John's idea of ha running it lean. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's the gift that keeps giving. If your <laughs> if your operations are low cost operations, yeah. uh, you know, you, you know, a lot of people don't understand like your equipment ends up on your balance sheet, right? Exactly. That's where it ends up. Okay. But then your profit is really, really dictated by, okay, how much did, how much was your materials? How much was your labor? And then, you know, how much gross margin that I get, right? Exactly. Okay, where, where did the inventory come into that? Well, and where did the uh, property, plant, and equipment come into that? Well, it came in through a depreciation expense on your, but very small because they depreciated over a certain amount of time. Exactly. Bam. Yep. So uh, really, you want to talk about the value of your operation mm -hmm. is really is the flow through to the bottom line, which creates cash. Throughput. Okay. And which, if you trade off, uh, if you trade off operating expense for something uh, less money on your balance sheet, you have basically just uh, devalued your business. Absolutely, no question. The, yeah, I mean, capital equipment is capital equipment, and even if it is an appreciating asset, you still depreciate it because you're allowed to do that, and you can write. 
a depreciation off on your income taxes, yeah. which is good. So right. You, so you want to minimize tax as a small business. Right. Pay your fair share always, but you know you want to minimize that outflow and take advantage of every opportunity that the right. government allows us. We should do uh, we should do a Q and A just on this because I I don't think uh, people really. Well, it's yeah. not, it's not necessarily, it's, it's basic business one-on-one, but it really makes a huge difference Absolutely. to, to our customers because what people are trying to, they, they got a small business, they're, um, they're, they're trying to figure out, uh, you know, how to make it profitable. Hopefully at some point in time, they're going to be in a situation where someone wants to buy them. And what really matters in that instance is the cash flow. Yeah, yeah. It, it's always about exit strategy because, and, and whether you're looking to sell down the road or not, um, you may get hit by a bus and now your spouse or your partner has to sell that business. Right. I mean, you got to make sure that you're planning for that. I mean, I don't mean to be morbid, but that's that's been my world for the last three decades is helping small business owners do that right. and, and get prepped and ready for that. So I love the idea of doing a and a on this. Yeah, uh, because we could I do some business... Uh... Yeah. You know, 101 or whatever. One of the things I was going to say, though, is even though it's an asset, it is still can be appreciating, even though you're depreciating it. And I know that's yeah, true. Odd, it's absolutely true. Yeah, because you were telling me the other yeah. day you had this. Okay, yeah. Well, well, yeah, it was kind of interesting. We we got a call. Um, one of our, um, there was an issue uh, basically with one of our customers. They had to shut down for a legal reason. Okay, so uh, whatever, it happens. And um, the, uh, the company had, they were wondering, okay, well, how can they assess the value of the equipment? And they were reaching out to us to help, help with that. Sure. Well, uh, you know, they bought that piece of equipment like two or three years ago. Okay. Um, you know, our prices are always going up, you know, essentially. So actually that, that piece of equipment with the lifetime, even, even with a corrected lifetime on it was, is worth more today than it was three years ago when they bought it. And it was significant. I it think was. it was almost like 30% yeah. higher in value yeah. uh, afterwards. So that is an appreciating asset uh, in, in this world. So that's, and again, that's more business 101. Yeah. So I, I, I love the idea of doing that. Yeah. Okay. Coming back to a really cool question that I have no idea any uh -oh. answer. So this is going to be kind of fun. <laughs> okay. Uh, Toby asks, okay, have you evaluated at, at any at line or inline semi quant technology to monitor the biomass oil quality? Okay. At line or in line. Okay. Semi quant technology. Okay. Semi quantitative technology. Have I evaluated it? Okay. So, Oh, okay. This is when I get to pull out my card carrying, uh, you know, I'm a scientist card. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. So selectivity is the game guys. That's all there is to it. Okay. So when you have a detector, um, you know, how will I say this? Oh, maybe this would be a good way to look at it. Okay. You guys can all see the pen here, right? Okay. So that's the camera now is selective for seeing this pen, right? Now wa watch what happens. Watch what happens here. Now they're not really able to see the pen very well, right? Now you're able to see it. Okay, that's selectivity. Okay, so um, what you want to do is you want to be able to measure, for example, uh, you know, the existence of pens, and you want to be able to do that uh, selectively. In other words, you don't care about all the other stuff that's in the camera. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want to be able to measure the, okay, some, some detectors, can't see it at all relative to, you couldn't really tell that difference from the rest of the, right. if you were to say, okay, what is he holding? No one would even know, right? Sure. Okay, and then some detectors can, can actually see, hey, that's a pen, oh. as opposed to the rest of the background. Okay, so semi-quantitative methods um, oftentimes have a hard time telling the pen from the background. Okay, so a couple different, you know, a lot of times they use like, uh, um, jujitsu, you know, like, uh, what do they call that? Uh, I call it mathematical jujitsu. They try to, you know, use mathematical tools to pull it out and okay. make a pattern. So they have a pattern instead of their, of, of, a, of an actual selective measurement. Okay. Um, I'm not, uh, totally disqualifying that, but I'm more of a selective guy. If I'm going to measure something and I'm going to have, uh, whether it's in line or out of line, I want to have something that's selective because I never know what I'm, what's in that background. 
Sure. So how will I, how will I know, how will I be able to calibrate it? If your background is always changing, what if, for example, I had a black background, how would you be able to see the pen at all when it was like this? Sure. Impossible, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if your variables, your input variables are changing, how in the world would I ever have, if I don't have a selective measurement, there'd be no way to really differentiate. And I might actually come up with the wrong conclusion. Sure. So, uh, the, so the question really is, what is the probability that you're going to come up with the right conclusion or a right answer? And then what's the probability of coming up with the wrong answer? And then what does it matter? Okay. Right? So there's three, three different questions. It, it may not matter at all. So who cares? Right? Well, then I can just put it on there. Then I'm just throwing the money away. If it doesn't matter, why measure it? Yeah. So, okay. So that, that question doesn't make any sense. Uh, what's the probability of having a, a, a positive, uh, a, a good positive, and what's the probability of having a false positive or a false negative? Okay, th these are the questions that you need to answer when you're talking about these semi-quantitative methods. Right. Okay, and so it's a complicated question, kind of a complicated answer, but at the bottom line is I'm a big believer in selectivity. Okay, so, um, you know, if you're going to take the time and the money to measure something, you better be able to zero it. You better be able to have a blank that doesn't give you an answer. Okay, so the blank shouldn't give you an answer. It should be like zero, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, yep. that's a problem with these semi-quantitative measurements. You take anything and you put it in there, you get an answer. Okay, yeah. so that's not very good. Okay, I just, I'm, I'm more, I'm, I don't know, what do you want to call that? More, yeah, you're more right. analytical than others. <laughs> and then uh, if you want to, you know, just use HPLC. It's super simple and inexpensive. Uh, and you get the answers that you need. Well, so, and that's a yeah. that's a good follow up question because there was there's another one uh, asking about testing. Mm -hmm. what, what type of tests do we have? And I think you you, re you alluded to that earlier as you were going through the flow yeah. of where you're testing. Yeah. Um, but the question is, you just brought up the HPLCs and things and testing. Right. Where are probably you know some of the most important places to test? I like to test it every yield process that matters. Okay. So. Um, we typically test, you know, at maybe five or six different places within the operation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and we would do, do things like potency, purity, identity. Uh, sometimes we would test for residual solvents. Um, typically at the very beginning, of course, that's where you want to make sure there's no pesticides coming into your operation. Okay, so that is absolutely critical. And then, um, like, we've received uh, biomass uh, from people who say, hey, this is great biomass. It's got 6%. And then, and then what? Oh, oh, we do analysis tests on it and it's got like hexane on it and heptane and people have been, you know, it's like, it's literally like toxic waste yeah. because they were using ethanol before and they're like, oh, hey, it's got 5%. Well, why does it have 5%? Because they, they didn't really efficiently extract it, right? They're just throwing it in a bag and sticking it into the gasoline, pulling it out with gasoline with ethanol. Okay, so it's ethanol. And then it's, it, it's in there. And then, uh, so we had to reject, uh, we had, we had something like 20,000 pounds come in on with that. Oh my That's God. crazy. Oh, that is crazy. Yeah. And it's like, okay, this stuff is hazardous waste. We're, yeah. we can't have this in our facility even. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to get rid of that, what do, what do they have to do? I don't know. They have to take it down to the dump and they're going to say, okay, they're probably not going to tell them it's hazardous waste. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know yeah. what they're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can smoke it. You can set it on fire. <laughs> I guess uh, that would be hazardous. we can put it in a pelletizer, yeah. a pelletizer, oh. make pellets out of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very we can good. make it for the pellet machine gun. That would work. Yeah. But not into burnable logs. Oh, yeah. Because that would be bad. Yeah. It's, it's probably, probably true. That's yeah. probably true. So, yeah, yeah. We, we won't do that. But, no. But testing, I think we could do a, a session sometime on just testing. Yeah. That would be great. That would be fun. That would be a lot of fun. And we have had like a giant rash of people saying, yes, business 101, bring it, bring it. Bring okay. It. Well. Because we've got a lot of startups on. We did the cannabis 101. Right. We're going to do business 101. And, you know, we love the topics. Oh, uh, yeah. That are coming up. Just in I see some Eddie's asking about a Headspace GC. Oh, right. Yeah. The Headspace GC is basically what will tell you if there's any uh, residual or leftover solvents like hexane or ethanol or heptane or something like that in your system. Sure. So you want to make sure that you have that, you know, in your process. Um, um, just uh, so that doesn't make much sense, you know, spend, spend some cash, get the equipment, run the equipment, and you have the answer immediately. Yeah. And you'll find out that it'll pay for itself. Do you know what a Headspace GC runs? Off the oh, um, hmm. I, I can get some quotations. I mean, we, we do a couple different things, Randy, different for our versions. customers. Yeah. And I, I mean, I would say that we have, like, sometimes we source uh, 
sometimes we can source some good used equipment. Um, but if they're going to buy brand new and but, everything, but in a scale, then is they it can like do that. hundreds of thousands of dollars. Nah, it's, a, it's basically for brand new, sixty to eighty grand. There you go. You know, That's for awesome. for used, it's typically you know thirty to fifty, something so like that, depending a, what you got. Uh, just a wag. Yeah. We're just throwing it out there. Yeah. And stuff. I know we've gone. This has been a great session today. We've yeah. got more questions, but yeah, I, I, I want to respect your in. time, and I uh, I apologize. We were kind of on a roll. I wasn't really looking, and we've been on just. Oh, just an hour and we so appreciate you being here yep. invite your friends invite your family mm -hmm. <laughs> no. uh, this is a business and you know your family would be bored to death <laughs> with this <laughs> stuff uh, and by the way kathy says hi oh okay <laughs> hi kathy hi <laughs> um, hi baby uh, so anyway we're we're here we love the questions we want to talk to you um at the end of this there is a um a link to um our uh, CBD jam sessions and CBD jam sessions are what we classify as that just a 20 minute call where you can call us and talk about whatever issues you're having right at the time. Where are you stuck? And you just get our whole team and we'll get, we'll channel you to the right guys. The front end guys can answer 80%, but if we need to move you in and get questions answered, we're happy to do that. Um, and we don't mind if what kind of questions they are. We just want to help you get to profitable revenue, right? We want to help you drive revenue. That's what we're about. Uh, do we sell equipment? Yes. Is that how we make money? Yes. But the reality is we want to help you. Yeah. And that's why we do these. These are, these are actually fun. Yeah, they are. I, I really enjoy these. Uh, so um, keep sending in the questions. We'll be here again next week at noon. Um, share that it'll be shared, um, you know, via email or whatever. So get that, uh, the calculators, I, I just had a reminder, people want the calculators. Oh yeah. So those are going to be available. I see that calculators, please. We're, we're, and <laughs> business 101 is coming up and, uh, oh yes. And testing. Got, oh my gosh. We have tons. We have tons of content. I know. I mean, we could probably do this every day. I don't think I could do it every day. Uh, no, I'm teasing. We <laughs> We well, we kind of do it every day. Uh, we do it every day. <laughs> we just haven't done it. We don't do it on no, okay. live. All right. But we do it every day. The, this is kind of a blow up session with Dr. John. And it's really good to get inside his brain. Sometimes it's scary. Um, <laughs> but it, it is it is good stuff. And we so appreciate you being here. Yes. You uh, enjoy your week. Stay safe and healthy. And we will see you next week. Take care. Bye Thank now. You.